Now then, you're welcome, Max. So Wolves have lost three of their first four games this season. Admittedly, one was in the Carabao Cup and the other was against Manchester City, but there's a 4-0 hammering against West Ham, not what we tend to associate with Nuno Espirito Santo. Jackie Oatley is with us, presenter of the Molyneux View, part of the Athletic family of podcasts. Jackie, how are you doing? Well, thank you. So can we, can we sound the, the full-blown crisis klaxon here? <laughs> no, it can't be, can it? It really can't be because they won the opening game of the season. Everything was hunky-dory, seemingly. They'd had the shortest pre-season in history, I think. A lot of the players arriving back, nine of them, on the Thursday before the Monday night opening game of the season. So, so little time to prepare. But since then, they have lost all three games. So, against Stoke in the League Cup at home, with virtually all the stars out on the pitch. Against Man City, no show in losing to Man City. But my goodness, that first half, they were all over the shop. Nothing like the Wolves we've come to respect. And then against West Ham United, what on earth was that all about? And we recorded an hour-long podcast going into all the details, which I'm quite sure you don't have time for today. But it's easily the worst performance under Nuno. It's easily the worst defeat under Nuno. And yes, it is very worrying. So he has a full week now on the training pitch to try and put things right before Fulham at home next Sunday. So what are the headline issues, bad pre-season aside? Yeah, so the issues are they have recruited, of course, but they've lost Matt Doherty. Well, Nuno is adamant he hasn't lost him, but as in they sold him, it's his decision. They wanted to upgrade him, in inverted commas, and they brought in Nelson Semedo, who made his debut against West Ham. He's going to need more than a couple of training sessions to fit into the Nuno way of doing things. Johnny, of course, is out with an ACL, and their wing-backs are absolutely key as to how they play. So they have the three at the back, but Saiz, even Cody... And Willy Bolly, normally so, so tight defensively, was so exposed. And I think one of the big problems was the fact they had both Neves and Matinho in the centre of the field, which, not being wise after the event, but looking at the team sheet before Man City at home and West Ham away, I remember thinking they need them Donker in there for the physicality, for the legs, the ability to burst forward from midfield. Neves and Matinho in particular, I mean, he's he scored one goal in 108 games or so. I mean, he's not a goal scorer. His passing was sideways. Neves' passing was sideways. They're not physical. They're too similar. Matinho's just turned 34. Uh, he's played a lot of football. And the front three, Adama Traore worked his socks off on the right. Neto worked his socks off, as did Raul in the centre. But the usual interchanging of passing that we've come used to from Wolves just wasn't there. And both the first two goals came from Raul trying to create something up front, running into trouble. West Ham deserve a huge amount of credit. They're extremely organised. Um, but they broke on the counter-attack and were 2-0 up. And when Haller scored the fourth with the easiest header in the world, completely unmarked, he didn't even celebrate. It was like shelling peas. It was just bizarre. Against a team that's supposed to be in crisis because they haven't added to their squad. Yeah. And I have heard from pretty reliable sources that Nuno traditionally works this team hard. You know, there are very, very few next to no days off. And so maybe when there's a drop off in fitness, it affects their performance, especially uh, dramatically. I am curious, you know, so he's been there, what, three years? This is the third year and he signed a new three year extension. I did wonder last year as they were on, off the back of another very good Premier League season and they were into the latter stages of the Europa League. It did cross my mind. Is this as good as it can get for Nuno? You know, I, I wouldn't, so clearly he doesn't think so and he's very happy there. But, you, you know, Wolves are in that tricky position where they've done so well and it's all gone so brilliantly that there's a ceiling approaching. Well, he would absolutely refute that on the basis that he's looking to climb even higher. And they're in a key transitional phase at the moment because if you see much of Wolves and it sounds like you have, then you'll know that they're very much a counter-attacking style of play and they've been absolutely... Um, They've torn teams apart in the way that they counter-attack. It's been absolutely thrilling to watch at times, which mm. has been brilliant for a newly promoted side, as they were two seasons ago, and, and finishing seventh twice. Um, but they're trying to evolve the style of play, and to do that, he wants players who are more comfortable in possession and not just rapid on the counter. So he was happy to let Jota go to Liverpool. He really was. It wasn't a case of losing one of the best players. He was happy. £45 million for Jota. Wow, that is a lot of money. Uh, but good luck to him. And he, But he signed an 18-year-old. He signed two 18-year-olds, one from Liverpool um, and one another Portuguese striker in Fabio Silva. So they really are ones for the future. 
And you would think in four or five years' time, this could be an outstanding site. But with Fosun having the money they have, the ambition they have, they are an investment firm, they want to see a return on that investment. They're saying it doesn't all have to be done today. Mm. But of course, whilst maybe a mid-table side season and perhaps a cup would definitely be seen as progress, um, they're, they're not prepared to just let this season, this season slide and to, uh, and to be hovering around relegation. I think it's not panic stations yet. Sure. It's a case of it was a horror show, an absolute horror show from back to front, from start to finish, apart from the goalkeeper. And they've got a week to work on it for Fulham at home. Um, but no, they are absolutely aiming to climb back into the European places and, and not let the season slide. But it's that transition. Mm. And Nuno really has to sort out the midfield. It's absolutely key to this. So that they don't leave the likes of Mikel Antonio one-on-one -on -one with Conor Cody. That's not been happening. That is not how they play. And they can't leave themselves so vulnerable again. That's an interesting point you made there about the possession the, or the move towards more of a possession game. Because against the that's what jumped out, you know, crucially. And they, they looked wrecked in that match as well. But if you're looking at that maybe as a litmus test of where they are, they couldn't keep the ball very much in that game. Yeah, and it is difficult to tell, isn't it? I mean, they played so many games. Was it 59 games that yeah. season? They, they played so much football and they just looked completely spent in the Olympiacos game before that. And so we didn't expect much from them. But my goodness, did Sevilla teach them a lesson. So we thought, OK, maybe it's just so much football this season. They're not in Europe. They are out of the League Cup, so they had a full week to prepare for the West Ham game, which West Ham didn't, by the way. They had a League Cup game in the week. Um, so, yeah, they were miles off severe, absolutely miles off them. But you do have to point, and it's not a case of finding excuses. You're trying to find reasons here, because Nuno has always met these challenges head on, and we've never seen them play like this before. And you do wonder whether the fact that they just didn't really have a pre-season. You know, West Ham had... Um, three weeks off, four weeks on the training ground. Wolves players had barely a couple of weeks off, straight into internationals, um, and back on the Thursday, straight into a match on Monday. That's not time to prepare for a new season or mentally rest. And, of course, virtually all of them are from abroad. Nuno's spoken about his stress, his anxiety at the moment, about the coronavirus restrictions, the fact that he can't see his family. He did seem very stressed to me when I watched his pre-match press conference on Friday. He did not seem a happy bunny. And I just wonder whether some of it's getting to him a little bit. Yes, I think some of the colour has gone out of lots of lives, hasn't it? And that would extend mm. to uh, Nuno, who must, I mean, has so much credit in the bank. I mean, we, like, we're kind of jumping the gun here in, in every respect by even talking about it. Even, uh, it it's no more than uh, a wobble and probably explainable uh, via the pre-season situation but Nuno as a personality he has been such a welcome addition to the Premier League over the last number of years incredibly charismatic incredibly likeable and even when things go against him manages to maintain a degree of dignity amidst the whole thing yeah and he's the sort of manager which if you've had an absolute howler of a refereeing decision against him he just won't talk about it mm. he will just say don't ask me about that whereas behind the scenes you know he's absolutely fuming think Burnley away and Doherty's handball, for example, wouldn't talk about it. Um, so he is a good character. He he instills this sense of, um, of, of um, camaraderie amongst his squad, which is so intense. He's known to be the most intense manager around, and I've spoken to some of his staff members who could absolutely vouch for that, so don't worry about that. He demands the highest standards from those people working with him and for him. But in terms of his players absolutely idolise him. Think of the players that he's persuaded to come from Champions League football to Championship football with the likes of Neves and, and Jota as well. And they have grown, they have improved under him. Uh, Adama Traore, remember him at Middlesbrough, no end product. He has completely transformed him. And the players really do love him. Media-wise, he's, he's fine, but it's not his favourite thing to do. Um, but he is very much loved. So, I mean, there's no talk of it, you know, the, the, them falling off the, you know, no. the rails at the moment. There's absolutely none of that. But that first half against Man City and the 90 minutes against West Ham, alarm bells will definitely be ringing, but for Nuno, not for their bosses, I would say. Yeah. Look, it's the Matt Doherty effect. I mean, we could have told you that weeks ago. This was, this was coming. <sighs> Um, well, I mean, I watched him in his game earlier on in the day for Tottenham and I just sat there thinking, oh, Matt, how Wolves miss this? You know, yeah. the, the one-twos, the cutting inside. But they're so used to that. And we're used to seeing Conor Cody pinging those diagonal balls straight onto the chest of, of Doherty and keeping the ball in play and then the one-twos. 
that there was none of that. It was Semedo's first game. There was one diagonal to Adama Traore, and that was it. So they yeah. need to sort it all out. So they need to sort it out. He is. He does love an underlap. Uh, Matt Doherty, doesn't he? he loves coming in field. We even saw it for Ireland. He started ahead of Seamus Coleman recently, and you know, we, traditionally it's it's chalk on your boots and get down the line. Matt Doherty loves coming inside, and it can cause havoc. He's so good at it. He is. I've watched so many of his games in the last few seasons. I mean, he was there a decade, remember? Yeah. And it, it just wasn't really seen as first team material, really, for for quite some time until Dean Saunders actually came in and uh, gave him his chance in League One uh, just before they got relegated to League One. Um, and the way that player has grown has been absolutely wonderful to watch. It really has. I mean, his fitness levels, as you'll probably be aware, didn't used to be tip top, but that's something that Nuno and his backroom staff have absolutely sorted out. Uh, one of his former teammates told me how he used to love drinking loads of orange juice and he thought he was being really healthy, but he had to learn about the nutritional side of things and realize that actually way too much orange juice is actually way too much sugar. And, and so he had to learn all that under Nuno and the team. And, and he really made the most of himself physically and the way he developed. And he, he's turned into a top class player. And a lot of Wolves fans are absolutely devastated to see him go, wish him well though. And they just hope that this new guy, Semedo, um, can kick on from the glimpses he showed at Barcelona and mm. become that really top level right wing back. Jackie, before you go, you touched on the ownership model there. You might just elaborate on that and the Mendes influence at the club. Is that still very much alive and well? Is he still the agent pulling the vast majority of the strings at Wolves? He is. He's the facilitator. He's not a director of football. He's not employed by the club. There are quite a few misconceptions about his role there, but he is very much, uh, he has the ear of the um, chairman, Jeff Shee, of course he does. Um, they're in business together. And But there is a very, very experienced um, recruitment team who a lot of people are thinking, well, what's the point of having a, a recruitment team, a really good, extensive recruitment team, if all the signings are George Mendes signings. Well, the point is, is that the recruitment team have a vast database of players who they have been watching all day, every day. They sit and watch and watch and watch and watch games, some of them in person and some of them watch them nonstop throughout the day. And they scout these players and they have records on these players. So when, for example, Fabio Silva becomes available, becomes available, was thought not to be, had 130-odd million euro release clause but Porto really needed the money so when he became available uh, it was a case of George Mendes saying look this guy's available do you want to take him and it wasn't a case of a chairman going oh he sounds good well do you think he's any good okay we'll sign him no 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 the recruitment team have this extensive database and they say we have been watching him in person for two years since he was a 16 year old kid and we know exactly what he's all about. Sign him straight away if you've got the chance. So really, they do work in tandem, but Mendes is the facilitator. Yes, all the deals this summer have been Mendes clients. So you look at that and think, mm. oh, yeah. Um, but of course, he works for several other clubs as well. It's not as though he's on the payroll and it's not as though he's just at Wolves. He, he facilitates and oils the wheels of a lot of deals between clubs around Europe and the world. Yeah, there's no avoiding them, really. I mean, if you want to buy anyone at this stage. Uh, Jackie Oatley from the Mullen U View, amongst other things. Thanks so much, Jackie. Thank you so much. Cheers.